Good morning, my fellow brothers. Walking the semen retention journey. Putting away the darkness, becoming light. Today is Thursday, February 23rd. And at 7.43 a.m., my prayer for you men who are listening as you win your spiritual battles against the lust and conquer it by crucifying your flesh and sacrificing. It is a sacrifice. Enduring the temptation and winning the battle over the demons of lust, guys. So today we're going to talk about how lust affects great men and how it can make great men fall. So one of the greatest men of all time in the Bible is King David. He, You probably have heard of him when he slew Goliath. So Goliath and King David, the famous story of how a young boy, through faith, killed this giant warrior. But we're not going to talk about that story today. We're going to talk about how lust made or destroyed King David. And later, as King David grew up and became a man, he was the king of Israel, of Jerusalem. And he was very powerful because he was righteous to God. So what happened is lust, he was he fell to the demons of lust, guys. I want to talk to you guys about it. It's in 2 Samuel chapter 11, and it's called David and Bathsheba. So let's start at verse 2. Late one afternoon after his midday rest, David got out of bed and was walking on the roof of the palace. As he looked out over the city, he noticed a woman of unusual beauty taking a bath. What does that sound like to you guys? He sees a naked woman taking a bath. Well, back in ancient days, they didn't have the internet and X-rated movies and images and girls on TikTok and YouTube showing cheeks and skin. So he actually saw this and it triggered lust in him, just like we battle every day when we see something It causes us to lust after it. He sent, verse 3, he sent someone to to find out who she was and he was told she is Bathsheba, the daughter of Eliam and the wife of Uriah the Hittite. Then David sent messengers to get her and when she came to the palace, he slept with her. She had just completed the purification rites after having her menstrual period. Then she returned home. So guys, as the king, he could do anything and he's in command and the people serve him. So he brought this woman that was married and fornicated with her. Verse 5, later when Bathsheba discovered that she was pregnant, she sent David a message saying, I'm pregnant. Then David sent word to Joab, send me Uriah the Hittite. So Joab sent him to David. Guys, a little background is... um, Uriah the Hittite was one of David's mighty warriors. And up here in verse 1 it says, I should have read it because they were at war, but David stayed behind in the city. So it says, in the spring of the year when kings normally go out to war, David sent Joab and the Israelite, Israelite army to fight the Ammonites. So they were at war. But it says David stayed home in Jerusalem. So Uriah the Hittite was the husband of this woman, Bathsheba, that David committed adultery with and fornicated with. So verse 7, when Uriah arrived, David asked him how Joab and the army were getting along and how the war was progressing. Then he told Uriah, go home and relax. David even sent a gift to Uriah after he had left the palace. But Uriah didn't go home. He slept that night at the palace entrance with the king's palace guard. 
Guys, the reason King David sent, wanted him, summoned him back from the war, he didn't need this mighty general or warrior to give him a report. Any messenger could have done that. He did that because he wanted uh, Uriah to sleep with his wife to cover up his sin. So the the baby that she would bo was going to have give birth to, he could say, oh, that's Uriah's child. And he would get off the hook. But here it says... Uriah did not do that. He slept on the entrance to the palace because he's a good soldier and he's a retainer. He doesn't want to release his seat. He won't even go home to see his wife. Verse 10, when David heard that Uriah had not gone home, he summoned him and asked him, what's the matter? Why didn't you go home last night after being away for so long? Uriah replied, The ark and the armies of Israel and Judah are living in tents, and Joab and my master's men are camping in the open fields. How could I go home to wine and dine and sleep with my wife? I swear that I would never do such a thing. So, he's a good, righteous man, concerned about the war and his men, and he won't go home and eat and sleep with his wife. And that's exactly what King David wants him to do. So then he can say that, because he knows Bathsheba is pregnant. And if she gives birth to the child, then his sin will be exposed. So he's attempting to cover it up. So verse 12 says, Well, stay here today, David told him, and tomorrow you may return to the army. So Uriah stayed in Jerusalem that day and the next. Then David invited him to dinner and got him drunk. But even then he couldn't get Uriah to go home to his wife. Again he slept at the palace entrance with the king's palace guard. So King David says, well, if I get him drunk, he'll go home and fornicate with his wife because he's drunk, but he didn't do it. So the next part, verse 14, this is the part where David arranges for Uriah's death. So the next morning, David wrote a letter to Joab and gave it to Uriah to deliver. The letter instructed Joab, Station Uriah on the front lines where the battle is fiercest, then pull back so that he will be killed. So you see, King David used Joab to kill Uriah. They conspired murder. Conspiracy to murder is what that's called, guys. So his lust of the flesh for another man's wife turned into murder as well. You see how the demons, once they get hold of your soul, they just continue to destroy you and get you to commit these kind of acts. So verse 16, So Joab assigned Uriah to a spot close to the city wall where he knew the enemy's strongest men were fighting. So, so you guys, you see Joab is the commander and he puts Uriah in danger. Verse 17, And when the enemy soldiers came out of the city to fight, Uriah the Hittite was killed, along with several, several other Israelite soldiers. Then Joab sent a battle report to David. He told his messenger, Report all the news of the battle to the king. But he might get angry and ask, Why did the troops go so close to the city? Didn't they know there would be shooting from the walls? Wasn't Ablamech, son of Gideon, killed by Thebes, by a woman who threw a millstone down on him from the wall? Why would you get so close to the wall? Then tell him Uriah the Hittite was killed, also, was killed too. So the messenger went to Jerusalem and gave a report to David. The enemy came out against us in the open fields, he said, and we chased them back to the city gate. The archers on the wall shot arrows at us. Some of the king's men were killed, including Uriah the Hittite. Well, tell Joab not to be discouraged, David said. The sword devours this one today and, the, and that one tomorrow. Fight harder next time and conquer the city. When Uriah's wife heard that her husband was dead, she mourned for him. 
When the period of mourning was over, David sent for her and brought her to the palace, and she became one one of his wives. That means he had multiple wives. Then she gave birth to a son, but the Lord was displeased with what David had done. So guys, <clears throat> he uh, lusted after another man's wife, committed adultery with her, and then the man she was married to was one of his great warriors, and he summoned him to get him drunk and tried to get him to sleep with his wife so he could cover up the illegitimate child. But that didn't work, so then he had him murdered. And then after he was murdered, he took the guy's Hittite's wife as his wife, and he had many wives. So he did evil, and the Lord was displeased with what David had done. Now, the next chapter, I'm not going to read it, guys, but there is a section. You can read it on your own, 2 Samuel 12. But anyway, I want to go to a verse where what happens. David confesses his guilt. Then David confessed to Nathan, I have sinned against the Lord. Nathan replied, yes, but the Lord has forgiven you and you won't die for this sin. Nevertheless, because you have shown utter contempt for the Lord by doing this, your child will die. After Nathan returned to his home, the Lord sent a deadly illness to the child of David and Uriah's wife. David begged God to spare the child. He went without food and lay all night on the ground. Then on the seventh day, the child died. So guys... There's a consequence for your sins. And I think King David even got off easy. He committed adultery, murder, and he had to pay the price, which was his child died. Now I'll finish the video with my own personal testimony, guys. When I was in my mid-20s, in the prime of my career, just out of college, making good money in a salary career I met a girl we fornicated she told me she was pregnant and I reacted like a child I said I'm too young to be married and raise a family which really was not true it was the perfect time I should have done the right thing married her had the child and started a family but I did what David did. I committed murder by telling her, I will take you to the abortion clinic and you will get an abortion. Yes, she agreed, but it was my prompting and that's what happened. And so I am guilty of murder, just like King David. And maybe that's why I've suffered a lot of curses in my life and I'm childless and all alone now. I can see that that's the price I had to pay for committing murder of an unborn child, guys. The Lord was displeased with me. So, if anyone's listening, do not ever have your unborn child murdered through abortion. There is a heavy price to pay. Guys, that's it. Love you, praying for you. Stay strong in the Lord. Stay strong on your journey. Continue the spiritual battle. Take care.